Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Can somebody bring me a bulletin? I know I had one, but it's floating around somewhere. Thank you. And that part, too. <laughs> I do the announcements from that. Okay. It is a gorgeous day outside. It's cold. It's beautiful. It's a little chilly. And I can breathe. So that makes it perfect for me. Although I do still cough and sneeze and all those good things. We have a few announcements. If you would turn to the insert. This is an insert out of necessity because our newsletter is not getting out on time because, quite frankly, Bonnie and I forgot about it. <laughs> and so did everybody else who were supposed to give stuff. So it's in process. So these are the things that you need to know uh, today. One other thing is that instead of Sherry Winicky as the liturgist, Joe Smith is going to be the liturgist. Um, Pay attention to the 8th, that's when the women get together to meet, do their elections, and we have lunch. Have you realized how much United Methodists do things around food? We really do. Then there's information on what to bring for NESAP. Nominations has three open slots for trustees. If anyone's interested, let me know. The school list for NESAP and the basket is back there on the chair if you would like to start bringing some of those things in. Um, the reconciling meeting that was on the 10th is now on the 4th, which is also the um, day that um, Amy's having her rehearsal. So I will be running back and maybe those of you who are here can, if Frank gets here before I get back, maybe you all can. Uh, reading. Um, Holy Humor Sunday is the 8th. We thought about this when Ruthie was doing the Wednesday night um, program and we were telling jokes and stuff. Holy Humor Sunday is usually the Sunday after Easter because it's a down Sunday and hardly anybody comes. But we decided with everything going on we needed to have a Holy Humor Sunday now. So that's what we're going to do on the 8th. So be collecting your jokes. There will be ample opportunity to share them. I put in here that they had to be appropriate to church, just in case some folks need that reminder. Um, but anything that's funny, um, and it can be uh, a motion joke, it can be a joke you tell just deadpan, it can be a joke you sing, whatever you want to do, it can be the joke. Deer Park asked that we put in information about their cold cut sub and ice cream Sunday sale. And the deadline uh, is September 15th, both for the orders and the payment. So if you're interested in that, um, please um, call the contact person on the bulletin. Are there other announcements that need to be made? Good morning. This morning we welcome um, Glenn and Barbara Patterson back to our church. Glenn will be providing our special music today, and I think as all of you know, um, both Glenn and Barbara are longtime um, supporters and patrons and teachers and everything else of, of the arts, you know, particularly music, and we're very grateful to have Glenn back today. And Barbara too. <laughs> Not to mention that the music is beautiful. Anybody else? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Did I count you? Eight. I think we got one more than the biggest Wednesday night that we had. So I am hoping that people are getting this last minute. We got to go somewhere out of their systems and come back. Um, and the folks who've been away for most of the summer, uh, they should be coming back at least by the end of the month. So we have different things happening, uh, and I hope that uh, you all will support that. Okay. 
And I'm going to turn it over to Joe for the rest of it. No, not completely the rest of it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, today's praise music is Congregational Choice, and Bob will be leading. Anybody have a suggestion? <coughs> Four seventy. Oh, I got the red one. The red one. The red one. Okay. I'll start off with uh, four oh one. You guys can keep looking. I just do a lucky flip to show the book whoever comes up to. Verses 1 and 4.
join me in the calls to worship responsibly. Sing a song of praise for the vineyard of our beloved. Do your life, O Lord. Clear your lives of the stones that hinder your growth. Give us life, O Lord. Place your faith in the one who makes you strong. Give us life, O Lord. Surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses, call on the one who comes to save us. As we gather to worship you, give us life, O Lord. Please remain standing and join me in the opening prayer. Lord of all, the door to your kingdom is open to the last and the least of all. We thank you for this time of worship. Lead us in the way you would have us go. We pray for Jesus Christ our Lord, who brings the light of a new day to us, now and forevermore. This is the day the Lord has made, and we rejoice in it. Amen. Our opening hymn is Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Of the righteous made perfect, 
and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. The Psalter today is Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6, with response, and 794 in the United Methodist Hymnal.
Truly. Joys and concerns, folks. Not only for ourselves, but for our God. Would you care to share? Thank you. I don't think I'm going to need one. There's not going to be a good day. Um, my sister's not doing well. I don't know you know. Um, she's been diagnosed with Parkinson's several years ago, and we don't really know exactly what is happening right now. She's just been um, having a lot of abdominal issues. She's really restless. She's lifeless. She's been to the hospital as an emergency patient because her blood pressure was high. They've done all kinds of tests. Um, and she is going to see a neurologist this week. So um, it's a little difficult for me because um, she gets very upset when I speak to her because she doesn't want to upset me. So I have to depend upon my brother-in-law to kind of give me updates. And as you all know me, I tend to be a warrior myself. And it's very, very hard. So please be with my sister Coral and her husband Jean and help me to be patient until we can get her some attention and see where we're headed with this. It's a very, very difficult thing when your loved one is away and you can't see her or talk to her. Yes. And just the process of having tests trying to find out something is exhausting. We'll be in prayer. Um, Ruthie. Um, just wanted to uh, let people know that Ruth Chrysler, uh, her cat uh, bit her on Tuesday. And uh, she did have to go to the ER, her hand was extremely swollen, her fingers, and it was going up her arm, was swelling. Um, they did x-rays to make sure that the cat hadn't left a tooth, broken off a tooth in there. Um, the swelling has gone down some, but her fingers are very swollen, and she is afraid they're going to have to cut her ring off, and she's very upset about that. She said it hasn't been off in 70 years, but she doesn't want to cut it off. Um, so, for somebody who was very limited prior to um, this, she now has only one hand to do things with. It's in a, a, a brace and a bandage, and um, she just needs a lot of attention and a lot of support. So yeah. if you get a chance to stop by or call, it's very difficult to make her answer the phone or come to the door, but it's worth making the effort if you can. Yeah. And she loves to get mail. She doesn't get it every day, but she does love to get mail and have somebody then tell her what it says. <laughs> Anybody else? <clears throat> so, I don't know if it's good news or bad news, but um, we did sell our beach house. Right. So we settled on the 13th, and we have canceled our plans to move to Delaware. So we will be around for a while, so you take it for good or bad. <laughs> I take it as a blessing. Thank you. She told me before it sold that I wouldn't get to go to the beach house. And I said, that's actually okay with me. I'm not a beach person. Get something in the mountain, and I'll be hounding you every day. <laughs> we already have that. Uh oh? We do have one. They have one for sale. You would buy it. <laughs> I just want a freeload. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Anybody else? Prayers? Um, as you all know, my friend Marilyn, she did complete her fourth chemo this past week, but she's having a really tough time. She is mentally, physically, and emotionally drained and exhausted. She's been taking, um, taking um, acupuncture, which has tended to help her, but this was reportedly her last one, we think, until she goes to the doctors this week and sees what's going on. But she just, every time I speak with her, she is just so totally wiped out and exhausted. She's still working. She owns her own salon. And I know that's probably part of it. But I just ask people to continue to pray for Marilyn. She's hopefully down to the wire. And hopefully now that the chemo has been, uh, or been administered, she can start to get her strength back. But it's really hard. She's young and she's very healthy. And it's hard when you just have, have the energy to do anything. Yeah. Let her know that we're still praying for it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh -huh. uh, and just prayers for Bob and I. We leave today for um, our train trip through the Canadian Rockies. So, for <laughs> us, we'll be I in think that's an awesome trip. one point and a glacier on another. And, you know, other. <laughs> Anyone else? 
pray for our world as always. Uh, there were some um, uh, shootings in Baltimore um, this um, weekend, and the one that took place at a two-year-old's birthday party just about did me in. Um, just pray that the violence finds a way to stop. Pray for the rainforest. Pray for the rainforest, that horrible fire. You know, we keep thinking about California and all its fires, but the rainforest is one of those incredibly important things to the world in terms of um, oxygen, <laughs> breathing, and, um, and it's just going on and on and on. So be in prayer. Let's go to our God. Lord, we come to you with all sorts of things on our mind this day. We thank you for the beauty of the day and the coolness of the air, even though we know it will warm up. We give you thanks that um, no matter what we are personally about, that you are with us, and that the same goes for all other people that you have created. Be with the world as it struggles with various things that threaten really the entire planet. Be with us as we struggle with personal things and with friends who struggle with difficult times and all the possibilities that are part of our lives. We are grateful that we have you to come to. We are grateful that your grace covers us all. And we are grateful, Lord, to be able to come together to praise you, to give you our thanks, and to worship you in all the varied ways that we do. Be with us this morning as we reach out to you and we pray to you the prayer that you as our Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And be us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is time for us to present to God our tithes and other offerings, and I ask that the ushers come forward um, to receive them. Oh, we'll get another gift.
out felt like it was disrespectful. But what it's talking about is Jesus being a part of human life in all of it. Um, the ups and downs, the celebrations, and the sorrows. And then at the end, a statement of faith. Let me know to the blind, 
to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, questions about proper Sabbath observant, observance will be a key conflict between Jesus and the religious authorities because Sabbath and its observant is the heart of Jesus' of Jewish practice. It was established by God in the fabric of creation, commanded directly by God to Moses in the Ten Commandments, and new teachings about the Sabbath could only come from God, or one authorized directly from God. Nothing is more challenging to any religious community than changes to its Sabbath. In our modern ears, we tend to focus on the woman's symptoms. She is bent over and skip over the cause of her ailment. And it clearly says that a spirit caused her ailment. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. 18 years. A powerful spirit indeed. In that time and culture, <clears throat> anyone with a physical deformity would also be socially deformed. That is, they would be shunned and they would be an outcast. They would lose their family support and they would become poor. In other words, they were precisely the people for whom Jesus has said he has come. And notice that Jesus sets the woman free. He doesn't heal her. This is not healing as we understand it. It is a freeing someone from what has bound them. It is having authority over powerful inner demons like when Christ freed us of our sins. Now, the process of healing and freeing um, begins with Jesus actually speaking to the woman, which is something that hasn't happened in 18 years. You didn't have a relationship with someone who was being um, so horrendously affected because it was believed that she did something wrong. Woman, he says, you were set free from your ailment, not just the physical ailment, but all those other things that went with it. So now she can be accepted into society. Now she can have her family back if they're still there. Now she can be taken care of by others and won't be poor. The social aspect of healing is empathized, emphasized in verse 16 where Jesus further identifies her status as a member of the community. This is not a Samaritan or somebody outside of the community. This is a daughter of Abraham. That is to say, one of us, as we too are all daughters and sons of Abraham. And he's reminding the people there. In response, you'll notice that the woman praises God, not Jesus, but God. And everyone in the room would have been awed by what just happened, and they would be very aware that a powerful holy man, Jesus, was in their midst. But she directs her praise to God. Because healing violates the Sabbath requirement, Jesus' action is a challenge, really, that rightly provokes a response from the leader of the synagogue, <clears throat> whose job it is to enforce the rules, the Sabbath laws. And Jesus meets this rebuke by first demonstrating his familiarity with the Sabbath law, the permitted care of animals, and then asks an unanswerable question that silences the opponent. Notice also Jesus' opponents are not ashamed because they've suddenly realized, oh yeah, we can feed the animals, we can take care of this woman. They are ashamed because Jesus has out-debated them because he's crafted a legitimate question for which they can give no honorable response that would also be acceptable to the watching crowd. I read this, and I think this lesson invites all of us to seek to follow Jesus today, to ponder the ways in which our own rules and customs and habits of what is right and proper have in fact become bad news for the poor, not good news, for the poor, the blind, and the oppressed and to break those bonds so that we might ourselves be proclaimers of good news, of release, recovery, and freedom. 
Several aspects of this scene relate to themes and ideas developed throughout Luke's Gospel. For example, the woman's deformity is characterized as bondage to Satan, the effects of a spirit. This language doesn't necessarily mean she was actually possessed by a demon, but this description reflects a common belief in the first century that one's physical and spiritual conditions were intricately related and never separable. The woman's posture is also a reflection of her social condition, diminished and frail, bent over. Salvation for her means freedom from spiritual, physical, and social oppression, just as others in Luke find similar freedom through Jesus' activity. No one in the crowd insinuates that it was a bad idea for Jesus to heal the suffering woman. The issue is timing. <clears throat> you can do all these things, but must you do them on the Sabbath? The synagogue leader contends that healing on the Sabbath violates the command to observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy because healing constitutes work. But when Jesus replies to the leader, he said the issue is not about what constitutes work. Rather, it's about the kinds of activities and uh, aims that truly reflect the purpose of the Sabbath. Remember when he and the disciples were walking through a grain field and ate some grain and the Pharisees got after him for that? And he said the Sabbath was made for the people, or the people was made for the Sabbath. In other words, it's not the rules that are important, it's how you live them out. It's that grace that comes from God. Healing appropriately reflects what the Sabbath is all about. We come here when we don't feel like anything is going right in our lives and what we are seeking is healing. We want to know that God is with us, present, right next to us. And we find that in the people who are also gathered, and in the music especially, and in the word, and in how you share with one another. These verses emphasize giving everything in creation a Sabbath rest, including land and slaves and livestock and people. The Sabbath exists, according to Deuteronomy 5, to proclaim God's commitment to renewal, what we might call wholeness, and not just for some but for all aspects of creation. Jesus was right on key when he talked about the law is necessary, but a human being on the Sabbath takes precedent over particular laws. And especially when you compare people to the animals that everyone knew was okay to take care of. After all, the healed woman is a daughter of Abraham. That little gem at the end, the daughter of Abraham, puts it all in perspective. What you're saying is one of your very own, called and claimed by God, is not worthy of being healed on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, grace, love, mercy, all those things take precedence. And yes, she will be set free on this Sabbath. So the question comes down for the folks gathered, and really for us too, which is it, the law or God's commandment of grace and love and mercy? Is it rules or is it the living presence of God in Jesus Christ? Is it all those things that the Jewish folks used to think of as important laws that, and maybe still do, 600 and some individual laws. Or is it Jesus who came to set us free? I tend to think that it's God's grace. And the reason for that is these stories, not just this healing, but the other healings, are about community. And what kind of a community do we want to be when we call ourselves the community of God in Jesus Christ? What kind of community? I don't think we can be a follower of Jesus and be a hater of anybody. 
I don't think we can use a law against somebody that keeps them pushed down, locked out, battered by the world. I don't think that if we have God's love in our heart for ourselves, that we cannot then share it with others. It's what we're supposed to do. So will our traditions hinder the daughter of Abraham in our day? Or any of God's children in our day? My prayer is that God's inclusivity be ours as well, that God's healing and power be ours as well, and that we then take what was given to us and share it with others. With God's help, so be it. Our closing hymn. Thank you.